Shall we, everyone? I want to start by saying, Levin, I love you. <laughs> that scared him a little bit. <laughs> You're like, cut, cut. <laughs> I think I scared him. I'm sorry. I'll use my catch-all excuse. Sorry, I'm, I'm American. Sorry. <laughs> And by the way, that works really well in Europe. I, I travel in Europe often, and I stumble around, like, especially the French notice that I'm not quite French, right? And they're like, like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I'm American. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, it works every time. All right, let's get to work here. Let's talk about the most misunderstood, misused, but frequently used auth protocol, OAuth. And uh, we're going to try to, this is an introduction to it. We could spend days talking about this. And it's not even a protocol, it's a standard. So my real goal here is to do two things. I want you to understand what OAuth 2 is all about. I want you to understand what the appropriate use cases are for it. And I want you to understand the only proper grant flow from a security perspective for delegation which is the authorization code grant flow. So we're gonna, and again, this, this is not an end to your studies of, of this particular standard protocol framework, whatever you wanna call it. There's multiple add-on RFCs and this is becoming more and more used in technology stacks today. So I wanna implore you to keep a close eye on this, read the white papers and get an intimate knowledge of OAuth 2. It's not going away, it's gonna be a core part of what we do in terms of identity management for many years to come. And it's crap, unfortunately. So let's get into it. My name is Jim. I'm gonna be your teacher for today, right? We're gonna look at OAuth terminology. We're gonna look at the whole concept of client registration when it comes to OAuth clients. We're gonna take a look at different grant types. In particular, we're gonna focus on the authorization code grant type. We'll look at the, the OAuth threat model that was published a couple years ago. And we'll also take a look at various countermeasures and controls that you need to be on top of when using OAuth. And so, yeah, so let's start by like, what is OAuth 2? Another note, I wanna highly encourage you to stop me at any time and ask questions, right? If you just kick back and listen for an hour and a half, that's boring and you go to sleep. So, yes, question. What's your question, Vincent? Yeah, yeah, I will. B briefly, I'll, I'll talk about OAuth 2, what came before it. What, I won't, I'm not going to focus much on OAuth 1 because we're not going to use OAuth 1 anymore. It's, it's, it's end of life. It's done. So we, you're going you're gonna to most likely uh, be, be exposed to OAuth 2. And if you're building new systems, if you're building authorization servers, which is what OAuth endpoints are called, it behooves you to use OAuth 2 for a variety of different reasons. So we're not going to put a lot of focus on OAuth 1. It's, it's dead. You might be stuck with some legacy. I'm sorry? You might be stuck with some legacy. I mean, if you keep not doing this anywhere else. Yeah, you will, but this is not something I want to put a lot of focus in on this, on this talk. I'll briefly mention it and, and move on. So let, let, let's do that. So let, let's start with what OAuth is. Now, when I say OAuth and OAuth 2, you might think of technologies like OpenID Connect. This is a federation technology built on top of OAuth. That I am not talking about OpenID Connect in this talk in any way. OpenID Connect is a stack on top of OAuth 2 used for completely different purposes. This talk is about OAuth 2 only not OpenID Connect. So when you look at OAuth by itself, it is a delegation protocol. We'll define that in just a minute more, more carefully. But suffice to say, OAuth is basically a valet key. Anyone here drive a fancy car or look at neighbors who drive fancy cars? You, when, when you have a, a BMW or a, or a Mercedes or a fancy car of some kind, you're given two keys with that, with that automobile. You're given the owner's key, and you're given the valet key. Let's define some properties of the owner key. What does the owner key do? This is an owner key. The owner key of an automobile is basically your credentials. What can we do with an owner key? We can start the car. We can turn off the car. 
We could drive the car at any speed the car is capable of driving at. We can open the trunk. I'm Sicilian, that's important to me, right? We can open the trunk and we can open the glove compartment in the front of the car. We can open and lock any of the doors. Those are all the basic operations of the owner key of an automobile. A valet key is like an OAuth token where I'm now giving this key, this valet key, to another entity to use my car even when I am not logged into that car, even when I'm not a participant in operating that car. I take this, I take this key, this valet key, I give it to the valet and I go to dinner. That valet key can now open at least the driver's door. They can drive the car at a limited speed, usually just the speed, the, the max speed limit for that country. They can, and they, what they can't do is drive the car at any speed. They cannot open the trunk with the valet key. They cannot open the glove compartment with the key. Maybe in some cases they can't open all the doors. It's a limited delegation of my account to another entity, and they can use that valet key even when I'm not a participant in, in you know, quote unquote, logging into that car. That's the difference. And if we want to complete the paradigm of the valet key to how it maps to OAuth, at any time as the owner, I should be able to press a button on my owner key and, and destroy the valet key at any time or, or invalidate it from being used. This idea is exactly what OAuth is about. I'm delegating not my entire account, but a subset of my account capabilities. We call that scope in OAuth. A subset of my account capabilities to another security token that we can give to other entities who can operate a part of my account feature set even when I am not logged in. That's what OAuth is all about. And so what should we not use OAuth for? We should not use OAuth by itself for a lot of things. We should not use OAuth for traditional access control. The scopes in OAuth are not going to map to your role-based access control system directly. They're not going to map to a capability system. You're usually going to need a mapping between the scope of access in an OAuth token to the different rules of access control that you have codified in your system. So we're not going to use OAuth as an access control system. We're going to use roles or capabilities for that usually. OAuth should not be used for authentication. In fact, there is nothing about OAuth that defines how to log you in. That's a separate issue. They assume, they, they're going to ask you to log in at certain parts of the workflow, but how that's done is never in any way defined by the OWASP standard. That's a separate issue. So we're not going to use OWASP to do authentication or session management. And also, we're not going to use OWASP for federation. Someone tell me, what is federation? Before we talk about this, does everybody know what federation is? Okay, what is it? Go for it. I love, I love asking the question. Folks go, yeah, I got it. I got it. It's not that I can get into the definition, but it's to make sure that uh, you can uh, federate, make two together, two entities, two uh, domains that can provide you from one domain to access something in another domain. Perfect. That's, that's a great definition. You have multiple domains in play, maybe multiple companies. It might be the university, and it might be Salesforce, right? So we want to be able to log into the university system and get automatic access to another domain like Salesforce. That's an example of a federated system. So it's basically, this is what Yo says. Yo says it's externalizing your identity provider. I like that definition a lot. It's taking the process of logging in, authenticating and establishing identity and externalizing it from your system in some way. And, this, and why do we need federation? Let's take a quick diversion. We need federation because, especially in the world of software as a service, when, when someone uses your service, they don't want to have to create a thousand accounts and delete accounts every time that someone leaves the company. They don't want to have to manage their list of users and identity processes in multiple locations. 
Ideally, you want to manage that in your one identity provider only and make sure that Salesforce and Twitter and everyone else understands your identity system to make it easier for you to manage the identity uh, processes of your users. That's the basic gist of why we need federation. It's really only popped up in web programming and web technology maybe in the last like, like 15 years or so as, as, service as software as a service began to proliferate, right? So this is what we should not be using OAuth for. As a side note, what technology that's built on top of OAuth should we use for federation? Just to make things a little confusing, OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect is a federation technology. It's built on top of OAuth. This is so you can log into Google and with your Google, uh, I, with, with your Google login, get automatic access to some of your own systems, right? So we're not gonna talk about that technology. I recommend you go to Yo's talk next. He will, he will discuss some, some, of these, some of these federation technologies in his talk coming up. But we're just gonna talk about OAuth 2 in and of itself. It is a delegation, not even a protocol. Let's be real specific here. OAuth 2 is a delegation framework. So, so those of you with PhDs, why, um, what's the difference between a standard and a framework? Why does OAuth self-describe itself as a framework and not a standard, and what does that mean for the variety of OWASP systems out there? This is a tough question. Anybody want to play? Philip, I was hoping you'd answer. What do you think? What does that mean for us who's trying to build standardized components against the OAuth 2 stack? They're screwed. Exactly. When we go look at Twitter's OAuth endpoints and Google's OAuth endpoints and DigitalOcean's OAuth endpoints and Facebook's OAuth endpoints, they are all different. Sometimes very different, sometimes slightly different. But this, this framework is not meant for interoperability. Because Google's OAuth endpoints do not need to interact with Twitter's OAuth endpoints usually. That's, it's not the need, it's, that need doesn't come up a lot. The need is for all, everybody who wants to use OAuth, uh, use Google's endpoints, they want to have some standard way to do so across a variety of different software and services. So, so far so good everyone? De so here, here's, the, here's a quiz question. This is the quiz question. What's What's the difference between delegation and federation? This would be a good essay question at, at the master's level, I dare say. Who wants to answer this for me? What's the difference between a delegation framework and a federation standard? What's the difference? What do you think? Can you, you want to go there? Go for it. What do you got? The difference between delegation and federation, no pressure, get this right, the whole, your life is on the line, go. No pressure. Limited in one direction, I like, so far so good. I think that's a, great, that's a very fair answer. I like it. Federation is about collapsing identi uh, multiple identity providers into one, possibly even an external provider. Usually with federation, right, I log in, and while I am logged in, I'm going to have access to, the, to, to what that identity system lets me do, right? It's usually about logging in and having some kind of session that tracks me as being logged in. So when I'm, when I'm doing federation, it's usually during my logged, my authenticated session, usually. Where with delegation, it's outside of the scope of my authenticated session, right? Someone had, I've delegated this token to another entity. I've now logged off and gone to bed, 
and they can still operate a subset of my account features even when I'm not logged in anymore. That's one of the big distinctions among these two different kinds of technology. So uh, those of you who are doing identity thinking in the future, I want you to really understand what federation is and what delegation is. These are distinct things. And I have talked to identity architects of many big companies who conflate these two terms. So get these terms right. This is a good place to start. Let's move on. This is where we're going to end up. I'm going to go over this a couple times in this talk. But this is the most important aspect to OAuth 2. It's the authorization code grant. This is the OAuth workflow that provides real security. It provides two layers of security that are critical. Number one, security benefit one of this workflow is that I can provide an OAuth delegation token to another service without having to give them my credentials. That's benefit number one. Benefit number two of this workflow, the user and the user's main browsing client are never going to get exposed to this high power um, access token. This is why this is so important. Let me repeat these two benefits. Benefit number one, and I'm, we're going to go over this a couple times in a couple different ways. So this is exposure number one. I see a lot of people going, what are you talking about? Benefit number one is I can give another entity access to a subset of my account so they can operate on my behalf when I'm logged off without having to hand them my credentials. Benefit number one. Benefit number two is that the access token at the end of this workflow your, the, your client server, what a great definition. The client, which is another server, is going to get an access token that will have an immense amount of power. And with this workflow, the user is never exposed to that. It's only communicated intra-server. So there's this other workflow called implicit, which we're not going to talk about today, where the access token is in the browser. And for the purpose of OAuth and delegation, I highly recommend you keep away from that other, these non authorization code grant types for the purpose of delegation. So let, let's get it, let's, let's do our first flow here. So let me, let, me, let me do it through this way. So here we have AppSec California 2015. I have logged into this website and uh, I, I want to provide the ability to connect my Twitter account to, the, to my Sketch account. This is the beginning of a no OAuth workflow. What I want is I want to give the Sketch website the ability to tweet on my behalf even when I am not logged in. That's the purpose of OAuth. And before I go too much deeper into this workflow, this need has been around for 20 years. How do you accomplish, how did we accomplish this goal in the past, right? Suppose you're the operator of Sketch and you want to be able to tweet on behalf of one of your users even when they're not logged in. How do we accomplish this? How did we accomplish this in the past? I would have to enter my credentials, boom, into Sketch account. In fact, last year at RSA, a conference I would never attend, don't go to RSA, they're of no integrity. So uh, I re erase that, erase that. So um, RSA last year, they, um, um, this is a big, one of the biggest security companies in the world, right? RSA basically set up a Twitter endpoint so, that, so they could have access to your Twitter account and literally asked you to enter your credentials into RSA's website for Twitter. And the security community like slaughtered them for doing this. Like, what are you people thinking? And their marketing person was like, well, we're concerned about ease of use, whatever. It's just, it's foolish. That's the kind of foolishness we want to avoid. Do you want to give your social media credentials to some arbitrary third-party site? No, you don't. That's why we need OAuth. Makes everyone with me so far? So far, so good, right? I see a few of you yawning. Oh, we're like just getting started. You can't yawn yet. We're not, we're not at yawn o'clock yet. So let's, let's connect my Twitter account to my Sketch account. I have, I'm already logged into Sketch, so I'm gonna, and, and before this even started, the Sketch web server registered itself as an OAuth client to Twitter. Let me say that again. Before this workflow even starts, 
the operators of the Sketch website had to register their website with, tw with, tw with Twitter servers. Twitter would then hand the Sketch website a client ID and secret to identify that server. Guess how OAuth defines, how does OAuth define how that client registration works? They do something in rugby, they, they, punt, they punted. They punted downfield and did not define it clearly at all. So much of the hard work of OAuth is, especially if you're building your own OAuth endpoint, you have to figure it out yourself or trust that some product you downloaded off the net is actually doing it properly and they almost never do. So let, let, let's get this started. I'm gonna click on connect to Twitter and I am now redirected to Twitter's OAuth endpoint with the client ID and client secret in the URL. That's bad, but this is what OAuth tells you to do. So again, since we can break OAuth, I try to avoid putting any kind of secret in a URL. If we go back to the core primitive rules of secure software on the web, one of the first rules of play when it comes to secure software is never put sensitive data in a URI. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is, the, this is the client ID and the client secret in the URL. Um, I, 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 I believe it is. This, this is part of how the, the first handshake to the OAuth authorization code works. We'll look at it in more detail in just a bit. Otherwise, how does the server know it's coming from a, 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 a confidential client? This is part of the confidential client, a confidential client workflow. The client registers with, with the, uh, and, and this is a bad idea, by the way. We should move to mutual TLS or something else and stop using client secrets. Give me one sec. So first, we re first the, 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 the server registers itself with the OAuth endpoint. The OAuth endpoint hands a client ID and secret back to that client server or other client entity, and those, that client ID and secret is needed to, to establish the beginning of an OAuth workflow. That's my understanding. And I, we'll, we'll look at it deeper in just a few slides. So, so the right. So this, this should just be the client secret then. C client, client ID, client ID. And is there any kind of establishment to, to ensure that the server is receiving this client ID from the right entity? Like, because this client ID is easily stolen, right? It's leaked all over the place. So what if I'm, what if I'm, a, what if I'm a malicious confidential client, I've stolen your client ID, I slap it in the URL, usually the, the authorization servers are gonna say, no problem, we're cool with that. And this is, this is a problem. And we'll look at that, but that's optional. That's optional. You can use the redirect URI in one of two ways. I can give it to you at registration time, at client registration time, and be done with it. But that's not the way every single OAuth product works. What they say is, also, in the middle of my workflow, you can provide another redirection ID at client establishment time. It's in the standard. And that's how most OAuth systems work. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. So what, what I want to recommend, recommendation number one, when you're doing your initial OAuth handshake, what you really want here, the client ID is fine. What you really need here is mutual TLS. You, you, you need, what, what I'm trying to say, even what you need to say here is, not only am I giving you the right client ID, but this interest server initial piece of communication must be done over, over I'm sorry, the, the let me take a step back and explain the workflow. I'm going to come back to that critique in just a moment. I think I'm going to explain it within this workflow. So let me take a step, let me take a step back and go through this. So we're at the beginning. Let's connect to Twitter. Let's let Sketch tweet on my behalf. I authorize, I, I, I get redirected to Twitter's API, and there's some kind of establishment that this is a legitimate client. We'll discuss that in just a bit. 
Now you have to log into Twitter and authorize Sketch. You're going to let Sketch read tweets. You'll see who you follow. They can post for you, but they won't let you do these things. Like you can't see the Twitter password. You can't access direct messages and so forth. Now, what, what Twitter does now is Twitter is going to hand an authorization code and, and uh, an authorization code ba back to Sketch. Sketch can now tweet, uh, and, and then Sketch will take the authorization code, and between the Sketch server and the Twitter server, Sketch will hand the authorization code, and Twitter will return the actual access token, which provides the power. Now, what most social media OAuth implementations do is they also give you a refresh token, which is permanent. And that refresh token gives you basically, it's basically a long-term session with permanent access to that account. And until a user goes to their user, until their, their user account, here I'm looking at, here I'm looking at my Sketch account, I'm looking at the, the list of connected clients to my Sketch account, and it says, hey, you're connected to Sketch. They've given you some permissions here. And that token is a lot, that refresh token is alive forever until you, until the user actively revokes it. This is the heart of how most social media, the first wave of folks who did OAuth, implement OAuth. And it, it's violating lots of very powerful things here. It's violating secrets and URLs, and it's violating basic session management. Long live access is usually something in security we wanna, we wanna avoid. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, this is exactly, this is me looking at my Sketch account where it's listing all other third-party entities that have access to my Sketch account and all and this connection is good. Whoa, 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 did I get this right? Am I looking at this? No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I got this wrong, I'm sorry. So let me take, let me take a step back. This is, this is on Twitter, my mistake. I've authorized the application, I'm at Twitter. Let me go back a step. I'm at Sketch. I connect to Twitter. I hand Twitter my, my client ID. I authorize Sketch from Twitter. I'm missing a slide here, I apologize. There's a redirection back to Sketch. Now we're all logged in. And this is my, this is my Twitter account that says, hey, you, I just gave a long-lived refresh token, long-lived to, uh, to Sketch, and we're gonna allow Sketch to act on your behalf until you revoke it. And guess how many users are aware that this even exists? Not enough. And so what usually happens is they establish OAuth, it's long term, and until there's a breach and tokens get stolen, this becomes permanent access to your account. Thoughts? Uh, so you couldn't have revoked it on your schedule? No, not, not, not the way OAuth works because Twitter is giving the power to Sketch. So Twitter is who, is who controls that token. Or, or Twitter is who controls when that token will be expired and no longer valid. And ideally, from the user experience perspective, it doesn't need to be a revocation. Exactly. When you log into Sketch next, you should be alerted that this is active. Or even better, when you log into Twitter, on a periodic basis, Twitter should say, hey, by the way, you've given Sketch permanent access to, to operate on your behalf, it's now been three months. Would, if you, would you like to revoke that? So it's up to either party, your client party and your authorization server endpoint party to inform the user about what's going on. And they tend to do a bad job of it. They tend to be quiet about this. So most, like I, I, went, I went and looked at my, my mother's Twitter account, right? And she had literally 50 different clients attached to it and had no idea because that, she's just going through the web, doing her thing, chatting away, and, and everyone and everyone and their mother has access to her access to her Twitter account. This is what it leads to for many users. Question? How many do you got? Ten. Did did you expect that? Or did you? Yeah. Did you expect that at all? This is, so this is very usable, right? The workflow to s establish this delegation is, is pretty straightforward these days for most users. But again, this is a long-lived session 
that does not expire until you take action. That's against all the principles of good session management. But it's okay for social media. This is meant for Twitter and, and, and pre-business Google and mostly social media companies were involved in this. So for a low risk kind of piece of software, depending on your perspective, I think this is acceptable. But this, is, this exact kind of methodology is now being rammed into the banking industry, the finance industry, the enterprise. So we have to be careful as to how we use this. We have to be very careful. So let's go back. Let me explain this workflow once more from, from this perspective. Let me, let's begin to define some of these terms. I want you to take a look at RFC 6749. That's the core OAuth RFC. Go read this a couple times. It's painful to read it, but it's going to help fill in a lot of the little details. It's easy to get this stuff wrong. So please go read the RFC. I don't like reading RFCs either, but I, I think it's necessary if you're going to work with these technologies so you can establish common terminology amongst the developers and architects working on this. So the resource owner is the person. The user agent in this case is going to be a browser. It might be a mobile app. The client in this case is going to be a server, just to add some confusion. And the authorization server is going to be the, in this case, the Twitter endpoint. So this is going to be Twitter. This is going to be Skedge. This is going to be a browser. And this is going to be me, the person. So I want to, I want to do this OAuth workflow. I'm going to start by clicking on the button to my client, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna click, uh, yeah, resource owner, user agent, server. I'm gonna click on a button that says connect to Twitter from Sked, and Skedge is gonna redirect me or, or link me out to Twitter with my client identifier. And, and again, Philip, in most implementations I've seen, it's client ID and secret. But the standard says, from what you're saying, it should just be client ID. If the client secret's part of that first hop, then so they're making a mistake usually. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, it's got the secret the exactly. Right. So it's, it's exposing the client's secret in a relatively insecure connection. The connection between Skedge and Twitter through the user agent of the, of the user's browser, this is an extraordinarily weak connection overall. And we'll, and we'll see, just follow with me on this. So we weakly send the client ID and, and an optional redirect ID to Twitter server. You have to log into Twitter, B, you're now authenticating to Twitter, and then you're authorizing that, that you're allowing Skedge to operate on your behalf. You're then redirected back to the server with an authorization code, right? This authorization code by itself can't do much. But now you're redirecting back to Skedge, the server grabs the authorization code off your URL, and now, intra-server, from Skedge's server to Twitter server, you're handing off the authorization code, you're handing off the client secret, an, op an optional redirection URL, and then the server hands the access token back to the server, and from that point on, the server can operate on your behalf. This connection between Skedge's server and Twitter server needs to be righteously secured. This is where you want to use, preferably, mutual TLS, PKI, certificates, the whole kit and caboodle to make sure that your actual access token is being handed off in a secure fashion. So the, the, the credentials are never exposed. The Twitter credentials are never exposed to Skedge. And the actual access token is never in the hands of the user in any way. The actual access token is only handed off intra-server. And, and once I say at Twitter, yes, it's OK to let Sketch operate on my behalf, this authorization code is handed off to Sketch server through my URL. And then that code is converted to the actual token. This is the way to roll with OAuth when you can. So far, so good, everyone? Please, go ahead. It's a server, to sketch server authenticating with Twitter server to establish token exchange. That's what mutual TLS is, basically. Well, no. ba basically, basically.
I, I agree with you. You're usually building it yourself, yo, if you're doing proof possession at that level. What I'm trying to say is if you're here, if you're building an authorization server, if you're a big player like Google, you have a dozen PhDs to throw at this problem and you can get it right. But if you're like a smaller company grabbing an OAuth commoditized server um, off, off the shelf, and are trying to ram hoard this in, you have to build it yourself, right? It's not built into products. But for a lot of the big players, especially like Deu we saw on the OAuth mailing list, right? Like Deutsche Bank and some of the, the more robust finance industry players, they're all, they've all done mutual TLS and proof of possession type technologies into a server for a while. So that's, this is the problem with OAuth. If you're a big company with lots of resources and you can throw a, a, a very senior team at the problem, you're likely to get a secure implementation if you have a web security expert team, your development group. And it, look, look, if you're Deutsche Bank, if you're Google, you got that. But if you're a smaller group or you have a handful of developers, you're almost definitely going to build this in an insecure fashion based on the tools and servers available today. So people either skip proof of possession, they skip mutual TLS, and they just send the client ID and client secret, which is a joke from a security perspective. It's hard-coded credentials. This is, so we gotta be careful here about really supporting this technology. My, you know my kind of black and white opinion on this. I say do this incredibly robustly secure with mutual TLS at least, or don't do it at all, or don't support this. And that's not an easy position to take, but that's my, but if we look at the history of OAuth in the last 12 months, there's been literally billions of tokens stolen from services throughout the world. This is, any, anyone who's a professional pen tester going against OAuth services, they love it. I, I, I talked to like Aaron Gutzman, who's a big mobile, mobile security pen tester. He is the biggest fan of OAuth because he pops some client, gets his hands on tokens, and he's done. He just grabs a couple refresh tokens from, from what he thinks are high-end uh, high users, and he's done, because he can now use that refresh token even in other servers, or even in his browser. Here's a refresh token, not even meant to be communicated from the browser to the OAuth endpoint, and he just grabs a refresh token from some pen test, drops it in the browser as if it's a refresh token, and guess what, uh, yo? It just works. So the OAuth, it, more than anything else, has become the hacker's friend because they can get their hands on long-lived session tokens with high-powered access to accounts that never expire. This is the majority of rollouts that I see out there and the experience that we've seen from pen testers over the last year or two. So it's a problem. Fair enough? Is that fair comments? Or? So let's look at some terminology here, right? We have the client application. This is the, this is the entity who's requesting delegated access to your protected resource, like the ability to tweet. The application that the resource owner is providing access to, right? Great. And it could be a web server. In most cases, it's going to be a web server. But if it's a native application workflow, it might be a desktop app. In some weird cases, it might be a, a, a mobile a, a, a browser or a mobile app, but your client is mostly going to be a web server in most OAuth workflows. We also have the idea of a confidential client versus a public client. So let's talk about what a confidential client is and what a public client is. A confidential client says, your client may not talk to my OAuth server until you register it with me ahead of time. This is especially valid when, you, when your client is an actual web server. So before I'm allowed to make OAuth requests to Twitter, I need to register my web server. And that whole client registration, guess how OAuth defines it? Philip, how does OAuth define client registration? Do they give us a clear path to how to build that? Or do they completely punt and push it back into our lap? They completely, I'm sorry, that was like a lead, that's called a leading question there. OAuth 2 punts and puts it on your lap to handle client registration. So in some cases, they just want the URL, 
and the logo of your website and a few bits of information and they let you register automatically. In some cases, the, the OAuth owner, the OAuth authorization server endpoint owner is gonna fully pen test your server before they allow you to register. It just depends. This is ill-defined even to this day. So that's what a confidential client is. That means you have to register, essentially register your web server with the OWASP server before they allow these OWASP communication workflows to begin. What, what's a public client? A public, now there's other workflows in OWASP besides authorization code. Suppose you just download Twitter's app from Twitter. And in, in fact, with, if you're an OSX user or an iOS user, it's, uh, if you're an OS, iOS user specifically, Twitter is very much baked into the OS to some degree. So when, when you actually download the client or use a client from Twitter, you do not have to register that client. It's a public client. And so I can just log into that client directly and I'll get an OAuth token directly. That's called the resource owner client credential grant or well, password credential grant, look at it in just a moment. But the idea is I don't have to register the use of that client before I can begin doing OAuth communication back to that server. So I really want to, I, I, I have two big work use cases for OAuth. If I'm providing a native app to my service, then I'm going to usually treat it like a public client and use one of the direct OAuth flows that, that's easy, that you log into it directly because I own the service and I own the client. If it's about third party delegation, then I'm gonna use confidential client and I'm usually gonna use the authorization code workflow. <coughs> Other high level terms, protected resource, that's like your account's ability to tweet and similar, that's just the feature or data we're trying to protect. The different actors in place are gonna be the OAuth uh, resource owner, that's the user. Client application, usually a server. Resource server, that's the OAuth endpoint that's serving out protected resources. The authorization server, that's the OAuth endpoint that's handing out various tokens, refresh tokens, and the user agent. The big difference between, and by the way, the, the resource server and the authorization server in this example would both be Twitter. The resource server is gonna actually hand out, is gonna be the endpoint that lets you tweet. The authorization server is part of the token flow. And what's the difference with these two parts of your service? It's really about which tokens they, they consume, right? The, the resource server is gonna consume an, uh, an access token, where an authorization server will consume the refresh token and then give you an access token after you give it the refresh token. We'll look at that again in just a moment. Here's our major token types, the refresh token, long live token to sit usually in the confidential client, access token, that's what the hackers wanna get their paws on. They want your access token. Once a hacker has your access token, they basically can operate as if they were you based on the scope of that token. That's the main goal of every hacker, get the tokens, and once they got the tokens, it's game over usually. Then you have the authorization code token. That's an intra-server token. To uh, th 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 that's a token that's given to the user to give to the server to give to the client server, which the client server gives to the OWASP server, so we can safely hand the, the client server a, an access token. Then OWASP two grant types. We talked about authorization code. There's also these other ones: implicit resource owner password credentials and client credentials, as well as the extension grant. That's where we get OpenID Connect. And I'm gonna skip that for now. One more time, let's look at these different tokens in place here. We have the access token. That's what actually you know, lets, lets me access protected resources on behalf of a user. Refresh tokens, long live tokens that we can store long-term uh, and, and request an access token at any time until the user revokes it. This tends to be fairly dangerous. We usually want to limit this to social media and then or, or low, low risk type of software. And we just mentioned the authorization code token, right? Enough, we already mentioned those. And one more thing I want to mention is the, again, these two OAuth endpoints that you're going to see. OAuth 2, allows us to separate the actual service provider 
from the, from the actual OAuth portion of your server. And so the service provider, the one that lets you tweet, is going to consume access tokens, where the authorization server is going to handle most of the other OAuth requests, including, including consumption of the resource token to get the access token. Please, please. Yes, you can. In fact, most of the products will let you do that. In fact, that's one way to, to, to manage the risk of a powerful refresh token. I've seen some people say, look, I'm going to give you a refresh token that's only, as, it's only going to be active for the current maximum session length at your application level. So one thing you could say is, look, I'll give you a refresh token, no problem, but it's only going to be good for like a couple hours because that's the max length of, of a session at Sketch. And then the access token, I'm only going to give you that for a couple minutes. That The life of an access token almost always should just be a couple minutes. And that's where the power is. So basically, I give you a refresh token. It's good for a couple hours. You make a request with the refresh token. I give you an access token. That's dead in a couple minutes. So you keep get asking for more access tokens. You keep, and then that's not, and, and then the refresh token dies a couple hours later, and you have to log in again at the service provider. That's not an uncommon, more secure workflow. That respects the whole idea of session management a bit better. And what some people do is they usually punt. They'll say, they'll do something called the implicit grant, and I'll just give you an access token that's good for a couple hours. I really want to avoid that in, in most cases. Yo? Just, just a little stretching, a little stretching. All right. All right. The, I forgive you. The only good, in my opinion, yo, the only good use of the implicit grant is when you're trying to establish identity over OpenID Connect. This is not OAuth 2, though. This is OpenID Connect. So if, again, if I'm trying to, if I'm, if I'm using you as an identity provider, and you as an identity provider want to give me just the OAuth token that establishes my identity, this is where o implicit is usually an acceptable grant. But in, in the OAuth world for delegation, we, the security community tends to disagree with using implicit for the purpose of delegation for these specific kinds of workflows. But for your world of OIDC Connect, that's much more established as an acceptable, acceptable um, use case. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. A few more notes. We have a, very often these are bearer tokens. What we mean by a bearer token is the bearer token has all the information that I need in that token to make, an, uh, to make a decision if we provide access. There's no, uh, it, it, it's, again, it's an independent token in and of itself. It doesn't require it, any kind of verification of a cryptographic key is in place. And that's the direction I think we do want to move into whenever we can. We really would prefer to have digital signatures and other cryptographic primitives to ensure that this token has not been stolen or minimize the possibility of the token being stolen. As it is today in the most implementations, these are raw bear tokens. I grab your access token. Even though it's used in your server, intra-server normally, I steal your access token, drop it in my browser, and in most cases it just works. That's the problem, yo. That's why OAuth is so fragile today because, because of it's super easy to use. And do you ever, ever Oprah Winfrey? You ever hear Oprah Winfrey, yo? She, 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 would, she very often in her show would be like, today we're giving out free cars, cars, cars for everyone. That's the same thing in OAuth. Tokens, tokens for everyone, tokens everywhere. Now these tokens are on, in URLs, they're protected weekly, they're stored long term, you just flip on an access token, good for three years, why not? And then the attacker grabs it and it's game over. That's what we want to avoid. Let's take all these terminologies and put them together in one idea here, right? Danny, who's the resource owner, has an account with Twitter, the service provider. Danny is also a regular customer of the website Ono Ono Lao Lao Hawaiian Cooking. Everyone say this, Ono Ono Lao Lao. Ono in Hawaiian means tasty. Lao Lao is a kind of food. It's a combination of pork, butterfish, 
and it's wrapped in tea leaves and then steamed. So you eat pork and butterfish, it's so, oh, so delicious. It's like, and wrapped with like spinach inside as well. So, uh, so this is a delicious Hawaiian treat website. Okay, so Danny's a regular customer of the website Ono Ono Lao Lao Hawaiian Cooking. And this website, Ono Ono Lao Lao, is a confidential client application. It registered with Twitter long ago. Danny can grant Ono Ono Lao Lao access to Danny's protected ability to tweet at Twitter, the resource server, without sharing Danny's username and password with Ono Ono Lao Lao's website. That's the client application. Instead, Danny's going to authenticate with Twitter, the authorization server endpoint, which issues the Ono Ono Lao Lao website an access token and a refresh token that will let Ono Ono Lao Lao tweet or access protected resources on behalf of Danny whenever he uploads a recipe. This, now what I'm asking, this is an intro talk, remember. If you're gonna talk, if you're gonna work at OAuth, if you're gonna work with OAuth technologies, if you're gonna be part of the team building an authorization server, using an OAuth product, or communicating with someone else's authorization server, please get your terminology right. I've been a part of dozens of OAuth conversations on the standard body list, or just with other developers, and the, our, our, the most major problem we have is that everyone gets these terms wrong. So I think as you, as you build an architectural team, just take a moment, steal the slides, establish terms, and make sure your conversations are using terms right so we can have meaningful conversations. Most OAuth debates in companies degenerate into a into a uh, morass of poor terminology and misunderstanding. One of the reasons why, another reason why it's so hard to work with this technology. And with that, we're done with the introduction of, of this slide deck. We can actually start the talk now, right? So this is, this is, a, this is my joke. I actually think that's funny, ha ha ha, <laughs> right? But really, what we just did, I haven't even started the talk yet. What I did was just set the talk up establish terminology, explain why you use OAuth, explain what the most important workflow is and why it's key, establish some of the problems around OAuth, and now we can begin a meaningful conversation. So this is kind of a joke, but it's also a, a point I'm trying to make is this is bleeping complex. So please take the time to read the RFCs if you're gonna be swimming in these technologies. All right, let's get into OAuth, right? Any questions on any of this before I charge on? Is this helpful, by the way? Is this helpful understanding this technology a bit better? Are you, I see a few yeses. Are, are you with me? Is this remotely helpful to your world? It is? All right, we're, all right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, say that. I, I ripped all those slides out. Let me, actually, do I have them here? Let me just check real quick. Yeah, I do. It's coming up next slide. Let me, I'll do it right now. We already did the simple OAuth workflow. I'm going to skip that for now. Let's, let, let's get right to it right now. OAuth 1 is, comp, is a cryptographic protocol, first and foremost. It's founded in digital signatures. A signed message is tied to the origin. Everything is proof of possession. It's all digital signature based. So. And, and OAuth 1 messages are all individually signed. This is beautiful. This requires a key exchange, but this is beautiful in terms from, from a mathematical security point of view. This is what we want in an authentication protocol. The problem is OAuth 1 really only supported web, web applications. When we look at OAuth 2, it supports native apps. It supports SPA type of applications. It supports web apps. It supports mobile. It supports cron jobs. It, it supports, it's, it even has an extension grant for other clients we haven't even thought up yet. The whole purpose of OAuth, one of the main purposes of OAuth 2 is to expand device support. They've done a very good job of that. The, 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 the native OAuth workflow RFC has just been locked down in the last couple, last couple of weeks, actually. So it, OAuth 2 expands your, your device capability. There, there's all the, but the reason why OAuth 1 failed, why a lot of the big companies joined the standard body, the framework body, and pushed OAuth 1's cryptographic primitives out, because interoperability 
of something as simple as a digital signature is painfully difficult. Think of, think of you as Twitter. Your Twitter, you release an OAuth 1 endpoint and everything is digital signature based. So you have to hand out cryptographic keys or have some kind of key exchange with all the different clients that you're supporting and, and, and they're going to need to sign their message that they send to you, which you're going to need to verify. You're going to need to sign some messages, which they're going to need to verify. And let me ask you this. If you're building a service and it becomes very popular, how many different programming languages are you going to need to support in terms of handshaking with your service? Here's a question. OAuth, uh, Twitter has their OAuth endpoint. How many different programming languages are trying to interact with Twitter? Three letters. All of them. Seriously, Twitter is a internationally radically popular service. It's taken over the zeitgeist of the world in many ways in terms of news and stuff. But OAuth in their original OAuth endpoint, they had, to, they had to support digital signatures with every single programming language that drives the web. Imagine you're one of the architects of Twitter and your job is to make sure all the different clients can, can work with Twitter, OAuth endpoint successfully. Do you want to be the guy or gal who's handling every single qu um, question from everyone trying to work with your service, trying to make their digital signatures compatible with yours? Our API in .NET 1 adds a space, but your API in Java doesn't, and your API in PHP adds two spaces. All these little idiosyncrasies, these tiny little differences between languages and different signature APIs, that's the nightmare that all the early adopters of OAuth had to handle. And even though in TLS we have this done well, it, 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 there's still a limited number of clients. There's only a couple browsers on a couple different platforms and we can make TLS work interoperably pretty well. When we have something like OAuth, the, the pain was too much and everybody involved wanted to move away from this. And that's why OAuth 1 got shown the door. As we move to OAuth 2, cryptography is optional. It's cryptography is not even described in the OAuth 2 spec. That's only add-on RFCs if you want to use them. It's not a core requirement of the framework like we saw in OAuth 1. There's a famous, uh, we, uh, there's a famous blog post from the original there's a famous blog post from the original author of OAuth 1, the original standard body um, lead, Aaron Hammer. Um, I, I believe the blog, the blog post was called OAuth 2 and the Path to Hell. It's a very famous blog post where Aaron Hammer, he didn't just quit the standard body, he rage quit the standard body. He declared OAuth 2 is insecure, no one should use it, and, and he described in detail why the, the use of bear tokens and why the OAuth 2 standard is going to lead to mammoth insecurity. He flipped them off and never looked back and worked on his own standards. And sure enough, years later, all of his predictions came true. We see 2016 is like the year of billions of OAuth token leakage throughout the industry. So Aaron was right. Yeah, I, I, I don't recommend you rage quit and flip off all the world's biggest companies in a blog post. It's, I'm not, that's not my style. There's better ways to roll, but he was right. We have a major, and, and by the way, all these cryptographic primitives that were in OAuth 1 that were removed from OAuth 2 are all being shoehorned back in in add-on RFCs. There's the proof of possession RFC and, and so on and so forth that brings back the crypto, which is what we need for real security. Any questions about anything so far? No questions? So enter OAuth 2, all of a sudden de uh, security is delegated away from, from, from digital signatures at the application level, and now everything, oh, security is now fully delegated to HTTP and TLS. And I firmly believe you, you can configure TLS correctly. What's an easier problem? Supporting TLS with everybody or supporting digital signatures at a lower level with everybody? By far, handling TLS, I think, is an easier problem because we have so many mature, relatively mature libraries in, in that world, right? 
It's an OAuth 2 is all centered around bearer tokens. Bearer tokens are radically easier for integration. It's incredibly complex though. I'm sorry, but incredibly weak from a security point of view. It's also much easier to work with. Um, I, I, even though it's easier to work with, <coughs> I believe it's easier to work with with a strong false sense of security. You, there's a lot of extra work you're going to want to do here to provide better security. But it is more flexible, radically more flexible. OAuth is built from the ground up to support any number of clients. And there's also, and this is something that OAuth 1 did wrong, I think, that OAuth 2 did well. There's also significant separation of duties here, right? There's great separation of duties. I can have one OAuth authorization server endpoint that's serving multiple resource endpoints, right? I can have, so, so I can really split things up into different pieces. Here's, here's an essay question to determine if you really get this stuff. The question is, when you have the resource endpoint versus the authorization endpoints in OAuth, which one consumes which tokens and why? What's the difference? And the answer to that would start, the, the resource endpoints consume access tokens. You've got to give me an access token for me to tweet on your behalf. The authorization endpoint usually handles resource tokens, authoriza authorization code tokens, and other authorization endpoints. So that, that's, a, that's a good illustration that you understand what the split of these endpoints are all about. So back to you, Vincent, right? Which should we use? This is a good question, right? Um, you know, Google moved away from OAuth 1 almost five years ago. So Twitter still supports OAuth 1, you know, but th their own, their, yeah. what's that? No, it's not. It's, rel rel it's relatively new, but you're right. So, you know, Twitter still supports OAuth 1. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, it's rare for any new server implementations to support OAuth 1. It's extremely, extremely rare. And there are plenty of, of OAuth 2 add-on RFCs to bring back the crypto if that's what you want. So, in 2017 and, and beyond, for almost all situations you're going to be in, you should probably be working with OAuth 2 and using the add-ons to OAuth 2 to get your crypto back. And, a, and a, a good cheap and dirty way to do it is to use JOTs, which, which for the most part demand digital signatures. So a one common way to use OAuth is to uh, OAuth 2 in a relatively secure fashion is to use OAuth 2 over well-configured TLS with JSON web tokens to handle some of the cryptographic primitives that we lost as we shifted to OAuth 2. Please see Philip's talks, Dr. Philip's talks for that. Philip went into, into JSON web tokens in great detail in both of his talks. It's, if you haven't seen them, you can go back to the recordings and take a look at that to understand what JOTs are and why they matter. Last but not least, uh, or not last, but you know, the, the, also the question is interoperability. Again, because OAuth 2 is more of a framework than a protocol, implementations are, are not likely to be naturally interoperable, nor do they need to be. OAuth, the OAuth endpoint of Twitter usually does not need to communicate with Google's endpoint, right? That kind of interoperability, at least at this stage, is not something that, that's really needed. And, and the big problem with OAuth 2 is that the OAuth 2 spec leaves so many components ill-defined. And it's your job to figure it out. That includes client registration, the capabilities of the authorization server, and discovering different endpoints are all up to you to figure out how it works. Now, there's RFCs to, that are beginning to define these things, but so much of this work is on your hands from a security point of view that's it, it, that, that's a major problem. What what time do I have until? By the way, oh, 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 I'm just do a quick time check. Twenty more minutes. Awesome. So let's let's let before I, I think we've talked about this stuff in a little bit of a loop. I'm sorry if that went on a little bit too much. Let's talk about the four different grant types. This is this is let let let's dig into it now. There are four major grant types within the world of OAuth that that, that I want to talk about. Authorization code again. It, you're hiding long-lived tokens from the user. You're hiding credentials 
from the client server. This is, this is the only way a client would, would never get to see user credentials as well. It's the most powerful way to use OAuth 2, but it's gonna be the most complex. This is called often called the three-legged hop or whatnot, but it's gonna give you the, the most security even though it has the most complexity. The easiest way to do OAuth is with an implicit grant, which means I just say, hey, OAuth, authorize me, and they just directly give you access tokens that are usually long-lived. Anytime you're requesting an access token that's alive for more than a few minutes, I think you have a major security problem here. My rule of thumb is, if you need an access token for more than a few minutes, then you should be getting a refresh token that, that, that can be managed from a, the user's account that is gonna require grabbing new access tokens on a regular basis. Anytime you're grabbing access tokens that has a long life, that's an anti-pattern from an OAuth point of view. And again, implicit grant is also gonna force credential exposure, and uh, sorry, um, um, implicit grant is gonna force the access token usually being in the hands of the user, in their browser, in the web application that the user is using, which is usually the worst place to put an access token because of cross-site scripting. One XSS, the access token is stolen, the system is fully compromised. So I, I personally try to keep away from the implicit grant in, in all of my work un, unless it's for the use of OpenID Connect, which is a different use case. Next, we have the resource, oh, resource owner password credentials grant. So when do we want to use the resource owner password credentials grant? When do we want to use this? This is what we want to use when the, the client application and the service are from the same provider. Again, if I'm, if I'm Facebook and I'm giving you the native Facebook mobile app from Facebook in your iOS device, then, those, then, then that, the native raw Facebook app will probably use the resource owner password credentials grant with the Facebook service. Because what this grant type asks you to do is to dump your user credentials directly into the client piece of software. So I enter my client credentials in directly. The client software hands those to the service. The service gives you an access token, and the access token is essentially like a session token, glorified session token. If, 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 the, if the owner of both, par, of both of these pieces are the same, this is no problem. But if you're downloading like uh, the Echo Phone Facebook app, this is the iOS app from a third-party provider, Echophone, who wrote their own Facebook app from scratch that uses Facebook APIs. Should you be entering your credentials into that directly? Absolutely not. No, you should not be. No third-party app to Facebook or Twitter or Google should ever harvest credentials directly. That's a violation of all that is good and just in the world from a security point of view and privacy point of view for that matter, right? So what we're gonna do in that case is, is usually use the mobile workflow, which is very similar to authorization code, right? You go to the mo you go, there's a, and there is a specific workflow just for this now outside of these four. Let's go over it briefly. This is the mobile, or this is the native app grant type is what they call it for OAuth 2. How does this grant type work? Well, it's not listed here. It's not a core OAuth 2 workflow. It's a new add-on that's still being solidified today. We just saw email about it. The RFC is at the review stage earlier, just a couple days ago, but it's getting close and people are using it as well. Well, I go to, I go to the third-party mobile app for starters and I say, I want to connect this mobile app to Twitter. Then they do a mobile redirect from the mobile app to Twitter, to, uh, to Facebook service in this case, and you log on to Facebook. You then log into Facebook, you approve that you wanna give this client access to your Facebook account, then they do a mobile redirect back to the mobile client with, the, with, the, with, the, with the refresh and access token that's short-lived. So it's usually a redirect where you're not logging into the mobile app directly anymore, they're gonna redirect you from mobile to the web, to a web browser in, with, within, your, within your mobile device. You log into the service. The service is gonna give you a refresh token and a mark in your account. Then they re-mobile redirect you back to the mobile app with the appropriate token. The whole purpose of that workflow is to avoid, to avoid 
harvesting credentials directly from a third-party app. And if Facebook notices any client that's not, that's not up doing this appropriately or that's harvesting credentials directly, they can try to shut that client down from using their service, right? That's the third type. So resource owner password credentials, that's a direct entry of credentials into the app, only if the service provider owns both sides. And last, we have the client credential grant. The client credential grant is used for things like a cron job. Some, anytime you have some kind of entity who needs access to your protected resources that's not specific to any one user, you're going to use the client credential grant. A typical use of this is like um, the uh, ADFS, the Federation Service for Microsoft. So this component needs access to the entire user database to start to make authentication decisions. So you may use the client credential grant so that software component can talk to certain privileged data that's not specific to any one user. That might be a, a larger portion of the database. Cool. Let's look at OAuth 2 tokens again in a little bit more detail, right? Now we're looking at the actual, the actual tokens. What's going to be inside of this token, right? We have the token type. This will define if it's a MAC token or a bear token and similar, no big deal. The expiration date, you'll have the actual expiration date inside the access token. The scope, the scope is going to define what actual access you're, you're, you're providing through this access token. This is what's going to map to your access control system or whatnot. And you know, access tokens are normally a bear token by, by default within the world of OAuth, defined in RFC 6750. What if these access tokens, which they do by default, have no integrity? What are some of the things that you can do as an attacker in terms of token modification? It's, it's right in front of you here. Describe some of the, again, this is another one of the most, the top tier problems with OAuth. By default, Remember, there's no digital signatures or integrity built in by default to OAuth 2. So if I hand you an access token, what's your attack? What are some of the attacks you can launch against this access token now? Change the expire time. Exactly. I'll change the expire time. Change the scope. There now now we're talking attacks. Yeah. And if there's no integrity in your access token, what advanced tool do you need to conduct the attack of doing scope modification? Notepad, exactly. You need a text editor. So I would say half of folks who roll out OAuth, my big attack is I log in, you hand me an access token, and I go switch my user ID, I switch out the scope, and I switch out the expiration time, and using Notepad, or if you like, text edit, I now have a long-term, five-year good access token with, for the administrator account that has every single scope available to that OAuth endpoint, and I'm 60 seconds into my attack. So how's that unencrypted token working for you, folks? What do we want to really use, Philip? What do we really want to use here? Philip. No, 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 I, I didn't mean, I, I meant yo. I meant to say yo, not Philip, I'm sorry. Yo, what do we want to use here? And what part of JOTS is most critical that we have? Which, which part of JOT technology is most critical for this discussion? And the signature, you can have a, a non-signed JOT, but at least we now have a standard to bring signatures back to a portion of our OAuth token through a JOT. And most APIs into JOTs provide signatures. And this is a nice standards-based way to add these signed claims into OAuth without too much heavy lifting. That's the way to roll. Because usually OAuth by itself, I mean, the, 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 the ease of compromise is pretty dramatic in, in most implementations I've looked at.
And, and, what, and if you're going to use jots and you're going to use digital signatures, what does it also bring back into your life? Everyone's favorite topic, PKI, key management, which sucks, which is heavy lifting, which is painful. So, you know, pick your poison. Do you want security and the complexity of PKI that goes with it? Or do you want the illusion of security and, and these high power tokens with no integrity? So, you know, in my world, it's, 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 it's one way or the other. You're either doing it securely or not. But the reality is there's many shades of gray here. And uh, it depends on the, the, the threat model of your application and what you're trying to accomplish. But just be aware of, of these issues that pop up. Let's, I have about five minutes. Let's go over some countermeasures, so things that we want to keep in mind. It's a good way to wrap up this section. Again, this, isn't a, this is scratching the surface of OAuth 2. We could go on for hours and dig into the details, but I hope I at least gave you a good introduction to understand the basics, to accelerate your future studies, give you a, a, the good base terminology for future discussions, and point you down the path of deeper study. So again, first of all, your homework is to go read RFC 6819. RFC 6819 is the, is the OWASP, uh, is the OWASP uh, threat model. They describe all these risks from just a few, it was published about a couple years ago, and they talk about the, di they talk about the different countermeasures that you want to consider. And he here are some of the examples of things they talk about. So first and foremost, when, you're, when you have an access token, you want this to be short-lived. Any access token must be short-lived. You know, low session time, and even in some cases I've seen one use per token. The refresh token must constantly ask for an access token. You get one use and it's revoked or expired. There's a whole revocation API to force revoke certain access tokens before their, access to before their, re before their expiration time. Make sure the scope of your tokens are as limited as possible. Be careful. I, I see a lot of folks just it's saying an access token is, is the same as the session, and you get full account access, please avoid that mistake. Limit, the whole purpose of OWASP is to limit this delegated access to as narrow a scope as possible. Also, when you're protecting an access token on your authorization server, it should be, it should be protected in a one-way fashion like any other credential. Where if you're storing the token in the client app, you need to put those in some kind of vault. If it's a mobile app, you want to stick it in, in whatever your crypto vault is of that particular OS operating system. If, it's, if you're putting it in a web server, you want to store it in, a, in some kind of HSM or crypto vault usually. But let me ask you this. When you're pushing out a social media endpoint like Twitter and Google, what's the likelihood that all the servers consuming your tokens are going to store them in a rigorously secure fashion? Zero. That's the right answer. And that's part of the problem of OAuth, right? Not only are we delegating access, but we're delegating security off to other servers as well, especially when you're using OAuth as is, out of the box, without the additional proof of possession, cryptographic, and other, and, and other security extensions that we can use to enhance OAuth too. Most folks just grab their token, stick it in the database somewhere, and they rock and roll. This is a path to what Oprah would say is tokens, tokens everywhere, and, and so on. Make sure that your authorization server provider, right, provides only necessary grants. We're almost done here, folks. Ensure, in fact, I'll, I'll finish this slide and we'll call it, we're, and, we're, and we're at time and we'll call it. Ensure the hardening of the authorization server is, is hardened from, auth, uh, from token theft. What we're basically saying here is make sure every single web security and server hardening best practice is in play. And that's all your job to get right. Let me say it again. Make sure that all the web security best practices and server hardening is all done correctly. How big is that body of knowledge, by the way? Look at the OWASP ASVS 3.0.1 standard. We're talking like 200 requirements that OWASP assumes you get right when you build your software. Unless you have a team of PhDs with an expert with expertise in web security, you're likely to get this wrong. So please be careful here again. The, the amount of security 
that's pushed into you, onto your shoulders when it comes to OWASP is pretty dramatic. You gotta use well-configured TLS in all aspects of OAuth 2 communication between, between any user and the authorization and resource endpoints and between any of your client servers and these endpoints as well. You need incredibly well-configured TLS. If TLS breaks down, this entire system is compromised. This was not the case in OAuth 1. OAuth 1 was a different era in web security. This is back when TLS was, was bad and we had no way to improve upon it. It was just, it was broken essentially. So OAuth 1 could still stay robust and secure even in the face of poor TLS. This is something to think about. And that's gone. OAuth 2, you've got to get TLS right in order for, in order for it to work. Also, make sure your access tokens are high entropy. Make sure the identifiers that, that, that establish the uniqueness of that token are, are unguessable and so on. And consider, and last note, and we'll call it, I'm a little bit late here, ensure strong authentication between the client app and the authorization server. I preach mutual TLS. <coughs> Yo mentioned adding proof of possession capability in. I think that's really the main lesson here. If you're going to do OAuth, you're in an enterprise environment, bring in mutual TLS, bring in proof of possession tokens, bring the cryptography and PKI back in, limit the scope of your tokens, make sure token loss doesn't lead to mass compromise and you're in a good place. Make sure you add integrity back into your tokens as well. That's the work I believe you have to do to build secure software. I hope this time was a, valuable, was a value to you in some way. I hope it helps accelerate your own learning of OWASP. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day, folks. Cheers. <laughs> Any questions about anything we talked about? Questions? Maybe you're getting them, but you don't need them. Turn them off. Maybe you're getting them, and you need to store them. Store them in a, on, the on the client server. Make sure you store them in some kind of vault, as, like any other cryptographic resource. On the authorization server, you want to store them in a one-way fashion with things like bcrypt, like you would store a password for verification purposes only. So again, my goal here is not to answer all your questions. My goal here is to now give you some ammo to go back to your current solution and really dig into the security to see what the heck's going on. You know what a lot of us do? We go grab Key Cloak, we drop it in, patch it. If, we're, if, if I'm lucky, we patch it. And then we, start, we, we put it on an endpoint and start requesting tokens and make things happen. That's what most teams do. That's a path to tokens, tokens everywhere, and mass ownage of your system. You gotta bring back in integrity with digital signatures, you, with, and JOTS usually. Yeah. You gotta bring, make sure your TLS is dialed in. You gotta limit your scope, blah, blah, blah. You have all these pieces to verify. Go back and do your work. I'll be watching. I got my eye on you guys. Get it done. No, I'm only kidding. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Coffee time? Coffee time. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> Woo.